My name is Ian Stocks. I'm a taxonomic entomologist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, the groups that I'm responsible for are the scales, mealybugs and their relatives, and the allorotidae, which are the white flies. Earlier in the training program, we went through an overall discussion of the superfamily Cocoidea and discussed uh, a number of the different families uh, that you might encounter. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to go uh, through an overview of the single family Coxidae, uh, otherwise known as the soft scales. This family is worldwide in distribution and currently contains 1,150 species, though this number grows uh, every year. There are many genera, some of which are quite large, for instance, the genus Pulvinaria and uh, genus Seroplastes, each have over 140 species in them. A recent assessment of the supergeneric relationships was published um, by Hodgson in 1994 in his identification manual to genera, in which he recognized nine subfamilies. Several of them are actually quite small. For instance, the subfamily Cisacoxini with the single uh, genus Cisacoccus. Um, but you can contrast that, for instance, with the uh, quite large subfamily Coxini, uh, which contains four tribes, each of which has uh, many genera. Um, biologically, they can occur on just about any part of the plant, um, but they're especially common on the stems, leaves, and fruit. Many species are, in fact, uh, significant economic pests of fruit and also landscaping plants. There are a number of families that bear an overall resemblance to many soft scale species, including the uh, Lecanodiospididae, the false pit scales, the Aclurididae, the flat grass scales, and the Kermesidae, uh, known as the gall like scales or Kermi scales but it's in details of the mic micromorphology in particular um, that distinguish the families, such as the presence or absence of certain characters. The illustrations in the plate on the right-hand side give you a little bit of a glimpse into what a tremendous amount of diversity there is in morphology, size, shape, color uh, found uh, at the family level. Um, in terms of shape, uh, the specimens can vary from essentially round to broadly oval to uh, quite elongate or have uh, one or more uh, lobed features on them. They can vary from nearly flat, especially in the early mature female stage, uh, to highly convex, uh, especially in the late mature female stage as she's uh, maturing eggs. Uh, in body outline, they can vary from symmetrical to asymmetrical. Uh, figure seven in the illustration plate, for instance, Eucalymnatus tessellatus, commonly is uh, found in, uh, with an asymmetrical outline on the leaf. And this can actually be determined by host morphology to a certain degree. Um, whether they abut against a major vein can influence the shape of the body margin. The size of the scale can vary um, at the species level from around a millimeter to over 10 millimeters for uh, the uh, uh, species Tumiella liriodendri, for instance. The color can vary among species, and it can also vary as a function of maturation with that uh, color change uh, usually resulting from um, significant changes in the degree of sclerotization. So in figure one and figure four, those are both uh, very mature adult females that have undergone extensive sclerotization. Wax production can vary from essentially no wax at all to very extensive. And the texture and composition of the wax can vary from cottony, especially in the ovisac uh, type of wax, uh, to flower-like, to hard, soft, or even glassy. And it can be regionally restricted on the body. For instance, it's produced uh, only on the dorsum or the venter. And some wax types develop with age. For instance, the wax produced um, uh, for ovisac production. We'll now move on to the uh, morphology and diagnosis part of the presentation where we'll dis discuss uh, the features that uh, you'll need to understand in order to identify to species uh, any given soft scale specimen. So below is a synopsis of scale structures that generally characterize uh, something as a specimen of the soft scale family. Um, the most important character overall is the presence of the anal area with two anal plates, otherwise known as a percula. Almost all soft scales have this, though there are uh, one or two uh, exceptions. Uh, more variable, though, are the characters below it. Um, usually there will be a conspicuous anal cleft, though that can be uh, variable in length depending on the species. 
and an irreversible anal ring at the end of the anal tube, and we'll discuss that uh, a little bit further in the presentation. Uh, the spiracular atrium is connected to the body margin uh, by a furrow containing wax pores, and uh, near the uh, margin of the spiracular uh, furrow, there will be differentiated spiracular CD, though that's not always, uh, not always the case. Uh, antennae and legs can vary from uh, fully developed to extremely reduced, uh, almost completely absent. And tubular ducts of various types can be present or absent. They can be dorsal or ventral in their distribution when present, or they can be both. Uh, multilocular pores of various types and distribution uh, are also important characters, as are the uh, dorsal CD, which can be of various sizes, shapes, and distribution. So where do you begin in identifying a, a slide uh, that has a soft scale on it? Well, hopefully you'll begin with the examination of a well-prepared slide, um, and you'll use that in conjunction with a uh, typical line art diagnostic illustration that you'd find in uh, published descriptions. Uh, the convention for the line art illustration is for the outline of the scale to be broken down the middle into a left half that uh, displays uh, characters found on the dorsum of the uh, scale and the right side of the illustration to show characters found uh, in the ventral view. So you would begin by getting a general assessment of the uh, features on the body, for instance the antennae, the legs, the spiracles, uh, the presence and nature of the spiracular CD and cleft, um, the shape of the anal plates, uh, the anal tube, the anal cleft, and the nature of the marginal CD. And you would compare those throughout the key and then in the diagnosis to the illustrations found in call-out pattern uh, surrounding the periphery of the uh, uh, line art illustration. So we'll discuss some of those most important uh, features in the morphology and diagnosis of soft scales. As I mentioned before, anal plates, uh, with very, very rare exceptions, are, um, uh, are uh, found in the uh, soft scales. Uh, they're also known as a percula. The shape, including the angle and the length of the edge, uh, are, are taxonomic, uh, taxonomically useful, as is the position um, relative to the posterior margin, uh, i.e., the length of the anal cleft, and the number, size, and distribution of CD found uh, on the surface of the anal plates. Uh, the bottom component to the uh, line art illustration here has a number of features that uh, don't typically appear in a key, but the ones in the top part of the illustration do. Um, you'll be asked to compare the margins of the uh, anal plates and the presence of things like discal CD, subdiscal CD, or apical CD. The plate, uh, illustration plate on the right-hand side with four illustrations shows uh, a little bit of the diversity you can find in the shape of the uh, anal plates. For very highly elongated in protopulvinaria to substantially elongated in uh, milviscutulus, to more or less quadrate or quadrate with rounded margins in the, gen, uh, in the genus Cocos. And this is the anal ring. It's a membranous, essentially membranous tube that is invaginated and has long CD uh, on its margin and is irreversible from the body. Uh, and this allows for the expulsion of uh, honeydew. Legs, when present, are also taxonomically very informative, but they can develop, uh, they can vary from being fully developed to uh, almost completely degenerate. Uh, also important is the claw and whether it has or lacks a denticle and the uh, uh, characteristics of the structures known as digitules, which appear on both the claw and the tarsus. The uh, shape, um, size, and degree of asymmetry in these digitules is taxonomically informative. Generally, though, the most important character is the presence or absence of the tibiotarsal sclerosis, um, otherwise known as the articular sclerosis, which is present in this picture here. It's typically present or absent at the species level, but occasionally you can find specimens within a population, uh, some of which will have it and some of which are, are lacking in it. Um, it has several conditions. This is the tibiotarsal uh, sclerosis here with full articulation, so the tarsus is free to move about this joint. 
Here's one with a tibiotarsal sclerosis, but generally lacking free articulation. And in the middle, there's no sclerosis at all, and the uh, tarsus is essentially rigidly fused to the tibia. Antennal morphology is uh, relatively straightforward. Um, there's usually, well, there's a maximum of eight segments, um, and that number is usually fixed within a species. Um, segment loss and or subdivision of segment can change the, uh, the, the apparent number of the segments, especially by the formation of pseudo-articulations. So for instance, you might see a faint line appearing along somewhere in here, making it appear as if this segment was actually two components, uh, but it'd still be counted as one. Uh, occasionally, you can find uh, uh, specimens with uh, asymmetric uh, segment count, so there might be six or seven in one side and seven and eight in the other. And a little bit of special terminology, the first segment is sometimes known as the scape, and the second segment is sometimes uh, known as the pedicel. The various types of ducts found um, in soft scales are some of the most important taxonomic characters uh, for species identification. The line art illustration uh, figured in the top left gives a little bit of uh, explanation, a little bit of an indication of how much variation there is in the morphology, though they are all thought to be essentially uh, homologous structures. There may be one to several uh, distinct morphologies even within a single species. Uh, they may also be regionally specific in their distribution, for instance, uh, restricted to either the dorsal, the dorsal or the ventral surface, or for instance, the marginal or submarginal area. Uh, you can even talk about the uh, morphology of an individual uh, duct, for instance, here. Um, this is the uh, uh, duct pore, the part that opens onto the cuticle. Uh, the cup-shaped invagination here. The outer duct part, the inner duct part, and the terminal gland part. And variations in the micromorphology of, of, of those elements uh, can be useful um, for diagnosing species. Another major duct type is the dorsal tubercle. Um, the standard dorsal tubercle is figured here on the left, a line art illustration. It's essentially a circular mound, um, but it does have a fairly complex internal micromorphology. And here's a light image of the same uh, structure. These occur submarginally in variable numbers. Um, it can be varied from zero or just a few to more than ten. Um, and they can be present or absent even within a single species. Um, for instance, it's typical for pulvinaria or bicola to have tubercles, but um, it's not uncommon for there to be none. A very special type of um, duct tubercle occurs in the genus Philophedra, where it's known as the inverted uh, tubercle. And it actually has an even more complex morphology than the typical variety. And the distribution can go um, uh, into the uh, submargin and even the medial areas of the body. There are a number of different pore types that occur uh, throughout the body of a soft scale, but some of the most important are the multilocular pore variety. These can be especially prevalent around the anal region and the vulva, and also in the sporangular furrow. Uh, one of the most important characters of the uh, multilocular pores is a number, a number of locules, um, which are these voids around the perimeter and here in the light micrograph. That number can be taxonomically significant. And the last major class of taxonomically informative characters are the seedy, especially their morphology and distribution. Uh, there are marginal seedy, which can vary from essentially spine-like to hair-like to uh, uh, fringed. Um, body seedy can vary, again, from hair-like to short and clubbed. And ventral seedy are usually taxonomically a little less informative. The most modified CD, though, um, are the, typically the spiracular CD. Um, in many genera, these, uh, are dis these form distinct uh, structures uh, at the opening of the spiracular furrow. Um, and a common configuration would be uh, a pair of modified CD surrounding a even more modified central CD that can vary uh, most uh, <coughs> most commonly in its length and 
shape. So now that we've discussed a little bit of the morphology, let's take a case study of uh, a relatively newly uh, discovered species in Florida, the species uh, Phylacrococcus howartoni, the croton scale. Now historically, there have only been uh, we've re records for about 44 species of soft scales recorded in Florida, but only a few are now considered major pests. In 2008, something new showed up in one of our southern counties, Monroe, on a very common landscaping plant, uh, commonly known as Croton or Codiaeum variegatum. Uh, this turned out to be not just a new species, but a new genus that was uh, described in 2010 as the name Phylacrococcus howartoni. It still has unknown um, uh, affinities with other soft scales um, because of the oddity of some of its characters, but it's thought that it possibly originated in Guatemala. Um, by 2010, uh, by 2012, we'd, re uh, uh, we'd assembled more than a thousand samples of this, uh, of this uh, new species, uh, documenting more than 70 host records. So this thing went from being undescribed to being a major pest in much of South Florida on a variety of plants. So how was it diagnosed as a new genus and new species? Uh, well, it, it was uh, primarily based on the fact that it ha had uh, no uh, dorsal and ventral ducts of any type uh, on its body. And it also had a complete absence of dorsal seeding, which is peculiar. And the sporangular uh, seeding um, also had a very peculiar morphology that's not been seen in any other, uh, any other species. This is a picture here of the adult females and immatures infesting uh, guava fruit. Uh, these are images of immature and uh, nearly mature male pupae on the underside of a leaf. And at the bottom is an adult female surrounded by immatures and an adult male. This presentation is a result of the collaboration of a number of people and in the institutions that they belong to. And these are listed on the slide. At this point, I'll take any questions you have. Can the wax produced by female used for identification? The wax produced by female uh, soft scales, um, the, the general pattern uh, is of, of some use, perhaps at the level of genus uh, in some cases. But at the level of species, uh, really won't be that um, uh, indicative of, of, of a species ID. Um, Perhaps the, the, the best known case of, of using wax for aiding an ID would be for the wax scales in genus Ceroplastes. Uh, in these uh, species, the wax produced is fairly ornate and, and highly patterned, and in some cases colored uh, in ways that vary amongst the species. So it can be used um, uh, to some degree uh, in, those, in, in those species. But by and large, again, uh, the uh, f the sort of the field level presentations of a, of a, of a species are not going to be suitable for a species ID. Why do soft scales produce wax and what's the biological basis for doing so? Wax, uh, like honeydew, is the result of, of the fact that these insects, uh, because they're uh, feeding in the vascular system, um, they're taking in excess carbohydrates. And uh, in the case of honeydew, they excrete that as a waste product. But in some cases, it's retasked and forms the wax. Um, the role that the wax has uh, in the life history of, of, say, soft scales, it might be that it um, protects the um, uh, otherwise possibly vulnerable body of the female from things like uh, dehydration or exposure to sun. It might offer some protection against uh, foraging predators or probing parasitoids. Um, so probably just depending on, on what species uh, is under consideration, the role that the wax plays uh, may vary. Um, uh, cottony waxes, for instance, uh, produced by uh, the genus Pulvinaria are used to form the ovisac and protect the eggs when the female is mature and, and laying eggs. So the waxes can have many roles depending on, on what species it is.